Today's video is brought to you by Raid Shadow Legends. Alright, show of hands, who wants to raise a team of champions and go forth and hack and slay your way to glory? I mean, who wouldn't want that, right? I really dig the fact that you can raise your own crew, arm them to the teeth, upgrade them at the tavern, and then come up with creative ways to mow down the opposition. This game brings the console experience of an immersive fantasy world right down to your mobile device or desktop. There are a host of different champions to choose from. My favorite is Norog. He's armored like a tank and brings a good defensive end, not to mention his name just kind of rolls off the tongue. What's also really great is that the developers keep coming up with new ways for you to quest your way to greatness in the world of Teleria. Right now there are a ton of new features and improvements, including a clan shop, new quests where your clan members can work together, not to mention that the Doom Tower has been upgraded as well. So there are secret rooms to check out and fierce new bosses like Bommel the Dreadhorn, whose lava attacks are intense, I'm talking serious magma here. While you're at it, you can also check out the dwarves, who come with their own backstory, groovy, over-the-top armor, and their own set of grievances. You'd probably have the same grievances too if your underground kingdom was invaded by Siroth's demonic forces. But no worries, the dwarven king raised an army, defeated this incoming invasion at great cost, and then joined the forces of light with some impressive champions including Tormin the Cold, whose power lies in his ability to freeze his opponents. The game is free to play, has multiple modes of gameplay, from dungeoneering to PvP arenas to taking on bosses. If you want to get a huge head start on Raid, all you have to do is hit the link in the description or scan my QR code, and you'll get an epic hero, Chinoro, who happens to be amazing in the Doom Tower, 200,000 silver, 1 XP boost, 1 energy refill, and 1 ancient shard so you can summon in an awesome champion as soon as you get in game. So hit that link and get your game on, after all, glory awaits people. And now folks, for the video that you've been waiting for. Near the western coast of France, about 80 miles north of Bordeaux, lies the fortress of Taylorburg. It was built from the ground up to be unconquerable. Its position high on a cliff was unapproachable from three sides. The fourth side had a triple wall with a triple trench, and it bristled with redundant strong points and fortifications. This was a Kobayashi Maru, a no-win scenario for anyone who was foolish enough to attempt to take it by force. Many had tried, only to walk away with a new lesson in humility. But then, in 1179, a new challenger arrived. His name, by the way, was Richard. In his life, he would gain many names. Among them was Richard I, also known as, well, the King of England. He was born in 1157, son to King Henry II of England, and the favorite to the Crusader Queen, Eleanor of Aquitaine, from whom he would receive the DNA of crusading fervor. From an early age, he showed great skill in politics and all things military. He was renowned for his courage and his sense of chivalry. He was going to really need this. Growing up in the tumultuous environment of Western Europe, his life would be dedicated to war. He learned quickly that to accomplish an objective would sometimes require absolute brutality, yet his mind possessed a rare gift of military brilliance. His ability in both grand strategy and battlefield tactics was far beyond his time. As Richard gazed upon the great fortress that now lay before him, he knew that an extended siege would only deplete his men and resources. However, his keen mind, like many outstanding generals in history, had already learned that brute force paled in comparison to the power of subterfuge, movement, and audacity which served as a force multiplier. Furthermore, if he was going to fight, he would be the one to choose the method in which it would be executed. 
Thus, he sent his men out to scavenge the surrounding countryside for spoils, but he made them use a scorched earth tactic. Every day, the defenders of Teleborg would watch their countryside being ravaged in flame. Richard could have cared less for the spoils that he procured. This was not really his goal. Rather, he guessed, correctly I might add, that the defenders were getting complacent in their strong defensive positions and would be quick to anger at the carnage they were now forced to watch. Richard, meanwhile, put on a show of deception, only lighting a few campfires at night, concealing his men, and always made them ride single file to hide their numbers. It worked. The defenders opened their gates and launched a counterattack into what they thought was a desperate opponent. But this was exactly what Richard was hoping for. He had set up an ambush, routed the incoming attack, and then chased the retreating men back through the open gates of their own fortress. Within two days, Richard was the master of the fortress of Teleborg. He had won the no-win scenario. As James Reston in his book, Warriors of God, would say, his reputation grew to continental proportions. Now with this victory, the nobles of Aquitaine fell into line as nobody wanted to mess with such a powerful and cunning warrior. Indeed, his French campaigns would even cause some to claim that the man had the heart of a lion. Go figure. His exploits were gaining him a fierce reputation. But for Richard, this would be nothing more than a warm-up. Western Europe at this time was heavily divided. France was ruled by the Capetian dynasty, and England was under the Angevins. Henry II had taken Normandy and then acquired Aquitaine after marrying Eleanor, who was previously married to the French king, Louis VII. Though the Angevins were technically vassals to the French Capetians, they were now more powerful, which was both awkward and would lead to years of warfare. However, there was considerable discord within the Angevins themselves as Henry II, Richard, and almost all of his brothers would almost consistently be fighting one another in a dizzying array of shifting alliances. Richard at one point would be at his father's feet, begging for forgiveness, and a few years later be trying to overthrow him. Henry II, on several different occasions, came very close to disowning Richard altogether, and as Henry's animosity grew, he even put his eldest son and heir, also named Henry, to the task of bringing Richard down. But in 1183, that would all change. James Reston explains, quote, Richard's older brother Henry took ill in June of 1183 and died. In one swoop, Henry II's plans were dashed. His heir was gone. The insurgents of Aquitaine had lost their champion, and the villain himself, the independent, indomitable, ruthless Richard, now stood as Henry's eldest son and heir to the English throne." End quote. But make no mistake, this by no means would cease hostilities between father and son. In fact, it would take something really big to even have a chance to disrupt their ongoing struggle. And this is where fate would intervene, far to the east in the embattled Holy Land of the Levant. Syria and Egypt had been unified into a powerful empire known as the Ayyubid by the Sultan Al-Nasir Salah al-Din Yusuf ibn Ayyub, but he was also known as Saladin. In early July of 1187, the Sultan had crushed the army of Jerusalem at the Battle of Hattin and a few months later in October had captured Jerusalem itself. After this, he would go on to essentially destroy most of the Crusader Kingdom. News of this disaster shocked Western Europe. And in November of 1187, Pope Gregory VIII announced a new crusade to recapture the Holy City and drive the Great Sultan from what had once been the Kingdom of Jerusalem. The call to crusade was in Richard's blood. That then, of course, an insatiable appetite for glory. He was among the very first to take up the cross, which he did in December of 1187. And this, in turn, would put considerable peer pressure on the kings of England and France to do likewise. 
Indeed, on January 21st, 1188, the kings of England and France met at the city of Gizor and announced their commitment to the crusade. By the way, it was here that the idea of a Saladin tax or tithe to pay for the campaign was created, with the added caveat that if you went on crusade, you didn't have to pay the tax, which would turn out to be an excellent tool for recruitment. However, negotiations during this conference would break down and the details of logistics would never be worked out. This did not deter Richard for a bit. His yearning to go east was as vibrant as ever. But before he could go on crusade, he would still have to deal with the ongoing war with his own father. And to do this, he would require an ally. Philip II, who would be known as Philip Augustus, was the son of the French crusader king Louis VII. In 1179, Louis had an attack of paralysis and feared for his own death, which prompted him to crown his son, who was only 15. On November 1st, 1179, Philip, that is, Philip Augustus, if you please, became the next king of the Capetian dynasty. Eleven months later, Louis died in 1180, making Philip the sole ruler of France. The man would have his hands full from the get-go as the ongoing conflict between England and France would persist. Thus, after the conference of Gizor in 1188 had broken down, Philip saw an opportunity with Richard to strike at the English king and to possibly destabilize the Angevin dynasty in the process. Richard and Philip made an alliance, combined their forces, and fought Henry II across Normandy and deep into France. The aging and vulnerable Henry II was no match. His son's onslaught, backed up by the French king, was simply too much. In early July of 1189, after being repeatedly defeated, Henry II had to come to terms. He announced Richard as his heir before his health completely failed him on July 6th. James Reston describes his final scene, quote, Richard knelt by his father's deathbed and wept, for he was not proud of his hostile actions against his own father, and they would haunt him for the rest of his life. Henry was unmoved. He turned his head to his son and spewed out his last venom. God grant that I may not die until I've had a fitting revenge on you. This was the last gasp of a dying man. He was carried off where he passed away a few days later. Later, Richard appeared at the funeral and was overcome with grief and guilt. It was said by a chronicler that when the son approached his father, blood burst from the nostrils of the corpse. This was a sinister and terrifying miracle which suggested that Richard had somehow killed his own father. End quote. After the death of his father, Richard briefly traveled to England. In Westminster, on September 3rd, 1189, he was crowned Richard I, King of England. From that moment onwards, he dedicated himself heart and soul into the monstrous task of organizing the crusade. The Saladin tithe was imposed, horses from all over the realm were procured, ships built, and an army raised. Being the astute general that he was, Richard painstakingly prepared and then prepared again. After all, he knew that all war was governed by the ironclad rule of logistics, and he planned accordingly. To support his cause, vast sums of money were raised. It was even remarked that the English king would have sold London if only he could find a buyer. Philip II did likewise and mobilized an impressive army as well. In early July of 1190, nearly a year to the day of Henry II's death, the two kings and their impressive armies set out from the city of Vézelay. But just as resplendent as they were, discord was noted. A contemporary chronicler would lament, quote, that immense army glowed with ardor and combined military discipline and goodwill. It could have been invincible to all the world. 
but it was riven with disputes and undermined by internal discord. Ties of fellowship were violated, and a house divided against itself is made desolate." End quote. The English fleet sailed from Dartmouth while Richard and his army made their way south to where the men spoke Italian. Eventually, after some delay, they all arrived at Messina in Sicily where he met up with Philip. But these two crusader kings would not be alone. Another powerful ruler had also taken up the cross. Frederick Barbarossa was a veteran of the Second Crusade as he had accompanied his uncle, the German King Conrad III. In Asia Minor, he witnessed how powerful a Seljuk attack could be. And at the walls of Damascus, he watched as the Second Crusade failed. He had absolutely no intention of repeating those mistakes. To his credit, Barbarossa was both an impressive military commander and a clever ruler. This man had the diplomatic finesse of an Otto von Bismarck, the tactical skill of a Frederick the Great, and the strategic insight of an Erich von Manstein. When he became Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire in 1155, he had to aggressively exploit these abilities. The Holy Roman Empire was a massive domain, but heavily fractured and prone to repeated rebellion. However, Barbarossa campaigned for decades and managed to unite the empire as never before. Thus, when the Third Crusade was preached in 1187, he was in a position that he could go east. He waited at first to see what his colleagues in the west would do. And then on May 27, 1188, he declared his intentions to go on crusade and then set out at the head of a grand army that was well provisioned and guided with German efficiency. Now it should be noted that more than a decade before this happened, he had made a treaty of friendship with Saladin. His honor as a warrior, however, mandated that he gave the Sultan fair warning of his approach. It was even recorded what he said, quote, now that you have profaned the Holy Land, we will proceed with due vigor against such presumptuous and criminal audacity. Restore the land which you have seized. We shall give you a period of 12 months, after which you shall experience the fortune of war. The youth of the Danube, who know not how to flee, the towering Bavarian, the cunning Swabian, the fiery Burgundian, you, God willing, shall learn the might of our victorious eagles and shall experience the anger of Germany." End quote. Barbarossa's army, according to some sources, which could be exaggerated, was estimated to be a hundred thousand strong. This absolutely sent chills into Saladin, who began to pull men from other fronts, including the Siege of Acre, more on that in a bit, to confront this striking new threat. The Germans made their way across Romania and Hungary without incident. It was only when they reached the Byzantine Empire that they met resistance. The Eastern Roman Emperor had made an alliance with Saladin to block Frederick's passage. But this didn't even begin to deter Barbarossa, who blitzed his way across the Balkans, taking out Byzantine strong points and cities along the way. By October of 1189, the German Emperor stood before Constantinople itself. He then used gunboat diplomacy to achieve an agreement with the Byzantine and crossed into Asia Minor at the Hellespont in February of 1190. Over the next few months, Barbarossa drove his army east, his forces clashing with the Seljuk repeatedly. The Seljuk were able at times to inflict serious casualties. But the Germans were able to give as well as receive. In May of 1190, they routed a major Seljuk army. And later in that same month, they were able to take the Seljuk capital of Iconium, stripping it of its treasury. The Seljuk would pull back as the German host made its way into Armenian Cilicia, but here disaster would strike. The tale of what happened next is described in the book Warriors of God. Quote, on June 10th, 1190, under the terrible heat of the dusty plain, the German crusaders began to ford a small Cilician river called the Salif, 
also known as the Iron River, on their final push into Syria. Broiling in his iron suit of armor, the emperor was barking orders in the shallow river amid a team of horses when suddenly the great beast and then his own horse spooked. The emperor was thrown into the water. Even though the river was no more than hip deep, the weight of his armor pulled the emperor down. In the shock of the cold water gushing through the crevices of his armor plate across his overheated skin, he had a heart attack and drowned. The consequence of the emperor's death was catastrophic. His army was thrown into chaos and disintegrated almost immediately. Seeing their opportunity, the Turks attacked from all sides, and the leaderless German soldiers melted into the countryside. Out of the nearly 100,000 men who had made their way through Byzantium, only about 5,000 eventually limped into Acre weeks later. End quote. For the German Emperor, his army, and perhaps even for the entire Third Crusade, June 10th was perhaps not a good day to die. The German contingent was essentially no more, but far to the west, Richard and Philip were still on their way. The King of England and the King of France arrived in the city of Messina in Sicily in September of 1190. There they would remain for several months, as the new King of Sicily, a man named Tancred, proved to be quite hostile. He had come to power the year before and had imprisoned the former King of Sicily's wife, a woman named Joan of England. She just happened to be Richard's sister, and if there is ever a lesson to be learned in crusading history, you don't mess with somebody's family, especially if they are the king or the sultan. It didn't take long for Richard to subdue the island and put down any rebellion, but by then the sailing season had passed. The next several months on the island were difficult for both Richard and Philip, animosity between them grew considerably. Eventually, it led to direct confrontation between the two kings, but in time they were able to come to some sort of agreement. It was decided that they would both continue on crusade, but Richard would no longer be marrying Philip's sister. Instead, Richard would now be betrothed to Berengaria of Navarre. But make no mistake, the compromise left both men with resentment. James Reston explains what happened next. Quote, on March 30th, 1191, King Philip of France left Sicily for the Holy Land in a pout. He left precipitously and unceremoniously since he did not want to suffer the embarrassment of encountering Princess Berengaria, who was replacing his half-sister as Richard's betrothed. Regardless of his emotional state, Philip's voyage was smooth and unmarred by mishap, and he arrived at Acre three weeks later on April 20th in good spirits. Richard's departure had more fanfare and his voyage more drama. With him would go the bulk of the Crusader fleet, which had swollen to an enormous size over the winter. On April 10th, the immense flotilla moved out to sea, 219 ships in all, setting a course due east. End quote. Richard's fleet sailed directly into a storm. This dispersed his ships. Some were destroyed, others were able to find safe harbor. One portion of the fleet, which carried Richard's sister Joan, his fiancée Berengaria, and most of his treasury, arrived at the city of Lemassol in southern Cyprus. Joan and Berengaria were treated exceptionally rude, denied entry into the port, and were not even given fresh water. Richard's treasury, by the way, was also taken. The man responsible was a Byzantine emperor named Isaac Komnenos. He would soon regret these actions. The Byzantine Empire at this time was in a really sad state. Its last golden age, known as the Komnenian Restoration, was over. A dark age had begun and was only getting worse. In 1180, Manuel I Komnenos, the last of the good emperors of the Komnenian Restoration, died. The despotic, xenophobic, some would say mad, Andronicus I Komnenos would seize power a few years later. 
Andronicus's reign began with a massacre of the Latins that were living in Constantinople. Men, women, and children from the West, numbering in the thousands, were slaughtered in the streets. The rest of Andronicus's time in power would descend into a reign of terror, which culminated with the emperor being executed in the Hippodrome. A new dynasty would come to power in 1185. They were known as the Angelos. John Julius Norwich, in a short history of Byzantium, lovingly describes them, quote, Of all the families that reigned over Byzantium, the Angeli were the worst. Their supremacy was mercifully short. The three Angelos emperors, Isaac II, Alexius III, and Alexius IV, altogether reigned only 19 years. But each was disastrous, and together they were responsible for Constantinople's greatest catastrophe. End quote. Isaac Komnenos was Manuel I's brother. Though he was the eldest, he had been passed over for the lead spot. Instead, he served his brother well in administration. But in 1180, he was captured by the Arminians. He was then imprisoned in chains for many years, where he grew hateful and developed a phobia for chains. He was released in 1185, but he knew that he would be a target for the new regime in Constantinople. However, as the Byzantine Empire continued to weaken under the Angelus dynasty, Isaac found an opportunity in Cyprus. He took the island, broke off from the Eastern Empire, declared himself his own emperor, and fended off a seaborne attack from Constantinople. From that time onwards, he ruled the island like a vicious tyrant. His people suffered immensely under his rule. On May 6th of 1191, Richard and a good portion of his fleet arrived at the harbor at Limassol. Isaac Komnenos watched the arrival, but he figured he was in a commanding position as he had numerical superiority in terms of troops. Richard was angry at the foul treatment that Isaac had dished out. He demanded the release of any prisoners, the return of his money, and he promised that with that they would simply be on their way. However, Isaac dismissed him, stating to the effect that he was an emperor and would have nothing to do with just a mere king. In retrospect, he might have chosen his words just a bit more carefully. With this response, Richard donned his armor, grabbed his weapon, and on cue, his men did likewise. Looking back at his men, the king gave one simple command, follow me, and with that the crusaders made their way ashore. The Emperor sent in his more numerous troops, who at first were able to mount a decent defense, but overall they were poorly trained. Richard, on the other hand, with his well-disciplined, more experienced knights, brought their crossbows to bear and began to mow down their opponents without remorse. The Byzantine army broke and then were routed. In fact, Richard attempted to hunt down the Emperor on horse, but Isaac Komnenos managed to escape. James Reston explains the pursuit that followed. Quote, Very early on the following morning, the king and fifty knights trotted out gingerly five miles to the east, near a castle called Colossi, where Isaac had regrouped and was ready for a fight. Even in the glow of dawn, with the camp asleep, the local force looked daunting. One company clerk was bold enough to whisper to the king, Sire, it appears to be a wise plan to decline a battle with so large and so powerful a multitude. Young man, you best confine yourself to your writing, the king snapped, and leave the war to us. End quote. Richard was vastly outnumbered, but what he lacked in manpower he compensated for with the element of surprise. James Reston continues with the king's version of a wake-up call. Quote, the engagement at Colossi was swift, violent, and short. The charge of the smaller force into the slumbering encampment dispatched the multitude. It was later reported that Richard chased the emperor in all of his imperial nakedness through the war in the tents. However, in whatever undignified state, the emperor managed to hightail it on his magnificent yellow Arabian stallion and fled through the Trodos Mountains towards Nicosia." End quote. 
With Isaac driven off, Richard returned to Limassol. There he took the castle and converted it into his base of operations while he waited for his fleet to arrive with more reinforcements. On May 11th of 1191, Guy of Lusignan arrived with 160 knights. Guy was now the deposed king of Jerusalem. He was the man who led his army to destruction at the Battle of Hattin in 1187. Saladin had released him in 1189, not so much out of goodwill, but rather to sow political disunity within the Crusader ranks. Guy had come directly from the trenches of the Siege of Acre, which at that time was well into its second year. He explained that Philip Augustus had already arrived and was even then making an alliance with Conrad of Montferrat against him. Conrad, by the way, was the lord and defender of the last Christian stronghold, the city of Tyre, and he was in no mood to share any power with Guy. Thus, Guy of Lusignan needed to counterbalance this threat, so he pledged his loyalty to Richard and urged that he come to the Levant as soon as possible. But Richard still had unfinished business to contend with. The very next day, on May 12, 1191, with his beachhead secured, the English king married Berengaria of Navarre. It was more so a political move to secure his allies back in Western Europe. The emperor, Isaac Comnenos, made a surprise appearance at the wedding and begged the king for forgiveness, which was given. But that very night, Isaac had a change of heart. He fled the royal ceremony to Nicosia, where he declared war against the Latins. Richard, at this point, had had enough. He didn't have time to placate any fool. He needed a decisive move, and his answer was, well, to take the entire island. Richard, first and foremost, divided his navy into two groups. The first group was to sweep around the western part of the island, destroying the emperor's navy and seizing ports along the way. The second part of his navy did exactly the same thing, except around the eastern part of Cyprus, cutting off any path that Isaac may have had to flee. Richard then placed Guy of Lusignan in charge of the army. For the next several days, Richard's army chased the emperor from one of his strong points to the next. The two armies actually met at a pitched battle known as Premathusa. But this wasn't even a contest. Isaac was defeated and had to run for his life once again. This time it was to his last stronghold, the fortress of Kantara. But even here he wasn't able to hold his ground. At the tip of the Carpus Peninsula, surrounded by Richard's army and navy, Isaac was finally captured. He fell to the king's feet and groveled with everything that he had, begging that no matter what happens, he should never be placed in iron chains again, as his phobia to them was now pathological. Richard agreed, no more iron chains. Instead, he had silver chains created, as probably befitting an emperor, and then sent Isaac back into imprisonment. Isaac Komnenos would be the last Byzantine emperor of Cyprus. In time, Guy of Lusignan would be given the island by Richard, and Guy and his descendants would rule the island for centuries. Cyprus was now a perfect base of operations. It had fertile fields, good cities, and exceptional ports. Indeed, the port city of Famagusta had an excellent harbor and received goods from three continents. The island, now secured, would be a constant source of provisions. Logistically, Richard was in a better position than ever before. It was now time for Richard to complete his Crusader oath. On June 5th, 1191, his navy and his men embarked from Famagusta. Their destination was the embattled city of Acre. A chronicler of the Third Crusade would describe it as, quote, if a ten-year war made Troy celebrated, if the triumph of the Christian made Antioch more illustrious, Acre will certainly obtain eternal fame as a city for which the whole world contended." End quote. Acre was in stalemate. For nearly two years, the Christian besiegers were unable to take the city, and yet Saladin and his army were unable to dislodge the Crusaders. On June 8, 1191, Richard arrived at the city and was eager to tip the scales of war in his favor. 
As he came upon the battlefield and assumed command of all forces, the king must have felt some sense of destiny, and perhaps he wasn't alone. The great contest between King and Sultan, Richard and Saladin, two indomitable men, both masters of war, had now begun.